Hello, good evening, everybody uh, from here in Dubai. Uh, well, today's topic is positive and proactive parenting. And I'm Dr. Tulika Shukla. I'm a specialist psychiatrist at Millennium Medical Center, Dubai. And I have completed my training in India at uh, Nimhans, Bengaluru and Ames, New Delhi. Uh, let's start with the presentation. Well, we all know that Parenting is one of the toughest and most fulfilling jobs in the world. Uh, the goal of parenting is to help children become the best version of themselves. And But despite that, despite wanting the best for our children, we are always left wondering and we are always thinking whether we are doing the right thing. And if you go online and if you go into a bookstore, you'll see that there is a lot of parenting advice available. And it just makes things more complicated about what could be the right thing to do. So what I have tried to do in today's seminar is that uh, I have tried to look at basic concepts in psychology, which uh, are, you know, which are used for parenting. And then we are going to use those uh, basic concepts and see how we can apply them into our daily lives. So before I begin the, web the webinar itself, Let's look at some of the wrong notions that a lot of parents have when they come into the clinic or when I'm talking to them, I have seen. So one is that I should be instinctively good at parenting. Everybody thinks that, uh, you know, we should know from the beginning what is what what we are supposed to do as a parent. Parenting is a skill and we can all learn to be better at it. So it's not something you are instinctively good at. You learn. Secondly, uh, you are either a good parent or a bad parent. Most of our uh, most parents are normal parents. Let's just say that there is a normal range of parenting behaviors and most parents are in that range. There is a right way of parenting and one size fits all. For example, these techniques worked for XYZ person. The same techniques are going to work for my child also. Doesn't really work like that because there is no right and wrong way of parenting. There is something called as goodness of fit parenting, which basically means that your parenting techniques should fit your child's temperament and their needs. Another one is that now that I'm a parent, all my time should be devoted to my child. Well, if you are feeling burnt out and if you're feeling overwhelmed with your parenting responsibilities, you will not be able to give your 100%. This generally happens when you stop devoting time for yourself, you stop devoting time for other things that you're supposed to do as a couple, and then you completely devote all your time to your parenting responsibilities, which is actually detrimental for as a parent. Lastly, if my child behaves in a wrong manner, I am a bad parent and I should feel ashamed. The truth is that any bad or wrong behavior that the child has developed is a problem that has to be understood and has to be corrected. If you have to analyze why the child is behaving in that way and there are techniques to correct it. It does not mean that you have failed as a parent and nobody has it right. So if there is a problematic behavior, you have to look for a solution for it rather than saying that the problem is with the child or the problem is with the parent. So what is this positive and proactive parenting? So. Positive basically means that the parenting is to be based on communication and mutual respect rather than on obedience. The idea of uh, is that the parenting experience should be enjoyable and fruitful for both the kid and the parent. It is not about, you know, that I have to enforce discipline on my child and uh, the child has to follow these things. It is not the relationship has to be the, the relationship is such it is such a uh, loving relationship. So if you follow the principles of positive parenting, if you follow the principles of communication and mutual respect, it will be enjoyable for both. Secondly, uh, it has to be proactive, which basically means that uh, it has to uh, be based on the child's developmental stage, temperament and needs. So if you already know what your child is going to need at a particular age, what is going to be the child's level of understanding at this particular age and what would be the right way of communicating with the child, you will find it very easy to communicate and discipline the child. 
So those are the few basic child psychology concepts that you need to know before you understand uh, parenting and the science behind parenting. First thing is that there are different domains of development. Then we need to understand regarding different temperament of a child. We also need to understand regarding the goodness of fit parenting. What is that I just talked about? Uh, lastly, we need to. Uh, there's a, a lot of disturbance coming in the background. Japanese, can you please? Uh, yeah, yeah. Just I think that's Tushara's uh, or is not. Please carry on, doctor. Now do not come. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the what we were talking about is goodness of it parenting. Then what is reinforcement and how do you use reinforcement in parenting? And lastly, the social learning theory. So I will not try to bore you with all these concepts. I will try to use examples of these uh, concepts and how do you use it in your parenting techniques. When we talk about the development of a child, there are different domains in which a child develops. There is motor development in the form of fine motor and gross motor. There is cognitive development or development of their intelligence. There is development of language. There is social and emotional development. Their self-help development, how much can they adapt to their environment? And lastly, their spiritual and moral development. Uh, all these domains of development are very important. And if you want to assess whether my child's development is up to the mark or not, or is there a problem in any of these areas, I suggest you go to the CDC, CDC website, which is Center for Disease Control and Prevention website. They have an app for milestone tracking and they have in detail according to two months, four months, six months, what should be the child's development? What all things the child should be able to do at this particular age is mentioned with a lot of uh, clarity for every domain. Uh, so for example, so why is this important? For why is the developmental milestones important? Why is the developmental level of the child important? Because if you are going to use neurotypical strategies with a child who has a developmental disorder, they will not work. For example, a child with autism, a child with ADHD, or if the child has intellectual disability or any other developmental disorder, the same techniques that you use for a neurotypical child will not work. And you need to discuss these techniques and you need to learn these from a specialist so that you can do successful parenting. So if your child has any developmental issue, the child needs to be assessed and specific techniques need to be used. If the child has regular development in all these areas, uh, one a very important thing, uh, if the child has neurotypical development, one area of development is moral development, which basically goes hand in hand with the intelligence development of the child. So there are some concepts that the child understands by a particular age. So if we talk about moral development of a child, before seven years of age, the child's understanding of morality or good and bad is dependent upon whether the thing is rewarded or it is punished, which basically means that any behavior which is, which is rewarded is good behavior. Any behavior which is consistently punished is bad behavior. For example, if you see small children when they are going to preschool, the teachers, they make stars in their notebook, uh, like, you know, in KG, in till almost till first standard, till the child is five or six years old, they make stars in their notebook or they give them a smiley on their notebook. But you don't use that technique for a child who is in fourth standard because they have outgrown that area of development. Uh, the same technique, so on the other hand, for a child who is between seven to 11 years of age, social approval and conforming to rules is more important. So the idea that I am a good boy and I am a bad boy because I do good things that everybody considers good is important. So if I have a group of friends and I am told by that group of friends that this is what a good person does, I will do those behaviors. And that is how social learning comes into play. More than, for children who are more than 11 years old, that is when they actually start developing the abstract concept of justice. 
or you know right and wrong which even if you don't get a reward for it it is still a good thing to do for example doing good things for the environment is good not because somebody will appreciate you but because it is a good value so this is very important because when you are teaching right and wrong to children you have to take into consideration what the child will understand so giving a lecture to a 3 year old child or a 4 year old child or a 5 year old child about right and wrong will not really help you have to teach them through rewards when i say reward i'll explain rewards uh, in the further slides when i explain reinforcement what does that mean uh before that we need to also understand the temperament of the child so thomas in chess they had given this concept where they had divided children's temperament into three major types where they said that there are 40% children who can be called as easy children because they are generally very happy they are very active and they adapt very easily to new situations the second group of children are the slow to warm up children when you take them to a new place they are not very okay with it but once they get adapted they are okay so they are very mellow they are not very hyperactive but and they have a lot of difficulty in adjusting to a new situation whether it is new foods or it is a new place but once they have adjusted once they have become come or new people also for that matter once they have adjusted they will be very comfortable the third group of children which are called as difficult children they are called difficult not because they are bad children but because they are difficult for the parents because they generally have very irregular habits their it's very easy their sleep patterns and their eating patterns get disturbed very easily for example the moment for example there are a lot of guests in the house the child uh, disrupt the child sleeping pattern will get disrupted very easily because there will be a lot of people who will be playing with the child and things like that similarly they will also find it very difficult adjusting to new situations the uh, other characteristic for these children would be that they express discomfort very strongly that they will express negative mood if they are unhappy they will let you know that they are not happy and the, what is important here is that uh, 35% of children one third of children have mixed traits of all these three types it's not always possible to put a child in one of these groups you might if people who have more than one children might be able to understand this difference very well that you know this is where my first child goes and this is where my second child goes so how do you do this uh, division and how, what does it tell you how does it help you so you can understand that there were nine qualities that thomas and chess looked at which was the activity level of the child rhythmicity how regular were the child's sleeping cycle and eating cycles uh distractibility how easily does the child get distracted when anything is put in their environment approach or withdrawal when anything new is given to the child does the child approach it or does the child withdraw from it does the child become anxious adaptability again how does the child adapt to new situations or new foods or new uh, uh toys attention span whether they get bored very easily and they leave that thing very easily persistence how long do they keep asking for something when they have been told that they will not get it how long do they persist intensity of reactions how strongly do they express their disagreement or dissatisfaction with anything lastly threshold of responsiveness this is how easily do they respond to the environment and lastly the overall quality of mood most of the time these things can be observed in a child at an age as early as 2 months temperament is something that a child is born with uh the same thing will get adapted over time so the same things you can observe in a child who is 2 years or even 10 years old so temperament more or less stays the same once you know the temperament of the child you have to adapt your parenting to the same what does that mean that basically means that for example if your toddler is a slow to warm up child you will have to try a new food a number of times before they will start liking it so they will you will give it to them first they will not like it you will give it to them again they will not like it after three four trials they will become comfortable with it and they might start eating it similarly if you have a very active child you have a very uh, a child with activity levels are very high 
you have to make sure that they do go out in the park every day and they play for a lot of time otherwise they are not going to stick to being uh, quiet and uh, settle down when they are supposed to at home now let's talk about reinforcement whenever we are trying to teach good behavior to children and bad behavior to children we have to reward every good behavior that they are doing and there has to be a negative consequence to the behavior to behaviors that are not wanted so there are two things here one is reinforcement and the other one is punishment the best way to encourage good behaviors is to use positive reinforcement this is if they did a good thing they will receive a reward for it the other technique that can be used is negative reinforcement which is if they do a good thing a bad thing will be taken away from them lastly there are te techniques of punishment where positive punishment is they did a bad thing and a bad thing was done in response so they did a undesirable behavior and a bad thing was done as a result of it lastly is negative punishment again the child did a particular so the ch the child uh, did a particular behavior and a uh, reward reward was taken away from them i'll give it you give you some examples so that this becomes a little more clear to you positive reinforcement can be a smile can be appreciation can be good grades that they get in class can be a trophy can be a new toy and can be attention all of these things can be positive reinforcements uh, for example if a child is jumping on the table and other people start laughing and clapping that is positive reinforcement of the jumping behavior if you don't want the child to do this behavior again and again you have to make sure that you do not reward this behavior it might be funny when they are doing it at home but then if they think that this is this is a good thing that they are doing they will they are more likely to repeat it at school also and they are more likely to repeat it in your guests presence also let's talk about negative reinforcement uh, for example the child has done something good and in return you take away one unpleasant thing that they were supposed to do for example you don't have to do a house chore for example it was their responsibility to take the garbage to clean their room but because they were very because they had done some other very good work they had helped you in the kitchen or something you uh, you gave them a reward by saying okay you did this today let i will take away that extra chore that you had to do or the, how can this work negatively is or how can this work uh, in a bad way is that suppose when uh, when uh, the child for example let's take the example of school refusal if the child has a stomach ache in the morning he knows that they will not have to go to school so if the school is a problematic place for them and they know that if i say that i have stomach ache i will not have to go to school that behavior is getting negatively reinforced so you need to understand why is school becoming a problem for them so a school this is a very important concept when children have school refusal that they don't want to go to school and they 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 start developing symptoms in the morning uh, very unpleasant symptoms in the morning uh, just before school time the another example for then coming to positive punishment again if the positive punishment is fairly simple to understand when the child behaves badly you give him a slap uh that is positive punishment uh or you put fines if for example if the, if the child behaves badly in school they have to pay a fine these are positive punishments please understand the words positive and negative here do not mean good and bad the word positive and negative are just trying to tell you that something is added or something is removed so nobody is saying that uh, slapping and giving fines is a good thing they are not to be they are actually very ineffective they are uh, the, they are the least effective way of reinforcing a behavior uh, lastly negative punishment is that something good that they already had they were getting every day is being removed for example taking away phone privileges or asking the child to be in time out for example the child is playing and they had behaved badly they are told that okay you will not be allowed to play with all the kids right now you have to go and sit separately for 10 minutes 
and think about what you have done. And when you come back, we will discuss. So that is negative punishment. So out of these four techniques that I have discussed, the most uh, uh, strongly, uh, which reinforces behaviors and is which is, has the most effect on learning is positive reinforcement, followed by negative reinforcement, then negative punishment, and lastly, positive punishment. So actually slapping and fines and all these behaviors do not are not very effective. Let's talk about what are, re, what are the kinds of reinforcement you can use. So for example, there are some primary reinforcers and secondary reinforcers. Primary reinforcers are those things which are biologically reinforcing. For example, food, water, sleep, shelter, safety, temperature, comfort. So for example, if a child is going to school and the uh, child has not, uh, does not have, does not feel safe over there or it is extremely hot in the school, the child will not want to go there because their primary needs are only not being met. On the other hand, uh, uh, similarly, if you look at secondary reinforcers, these are learned by association. For example, appreciation, good grades, money, the child learns over time that these are uh, reinforcements. So anything that makes the child uh, biologically comfortable or uncomfortable are primary reinforcers. Whereas what the child learns over time are secondary reinforcers. Uh, coming to characteristics of reinforcements and punishments. So the how do you make sure that the reinforcements are being learned? How do you make sure that this learning happens when you are using reinforcement techniques? So uh, let's say whenever the child is doing a behavior and you are trying to reinforce it, the reinforcement has to be immediate. For example, if the child has done very well in the test, you take the child out for a nice meal. This is immediate. It has to be done immediately. If you are going to say, okay, I am going to give you the reward and then you say, we will go next week, the reward won't work. The reward has to be given immediately after the good behavior has happened. It should be natural. Uh, for example, if... Uh, Sometimes, for example, if the child is repeatedly forgetting to take their tiffin to school and every time you are putting in their bag, they are not really having a learning experience. So maybe once in a while, you can let them forget when they will face the bad consequences or the natural consequences of a mistake, they will learn. But in this, you have to make sure that the child is safe. You don't have to uh, put them in danger of any sort. Uh, then it should be logically related to the behavior. For example, if the child has uh, not cleaned their bicycle, they were supposed to clean their bicycle and they're not cleaning the bicycle regularly and they're just leaving it like that, you take away their bicycle time. They enjoy riding the bicycle. It is a positive reinforcement for them. Uh, or it's, uh, you take it away. So this would be an example of negative reinforcement actually, but then it has to be logically related to the behavior. They did not do the uh, cleaning of the bike, so the bike uh, privilege was taken away. Similar, and then the magnitude. Magnitude is also important. If they have done a small mistake and you give them a very large punishment, it, it does not make sense. So uh, depending, and similarly, if they have done a bigger achievement, if they have come first in class or they have come, uh, they have won a trophy at a competition, the reward given by you should be of the same magnitude. Uh, lastly, uh, reinforcement is just one way by which children learn things. The other more important technique that children uh, are learning things by are observing, which is co called as the social learning theory. Whatever they see around them, they are absorbing like a sponge. Learning happens not only through reinforcement, but also through observation. Children are observing multiple things. But what determines that they will acquire or they will learn what they have observed? Which behaviors will be learned? So first, there are four elements of social learning. First of all, the child has to pay attention to that behavior. So for example, if something is happening in their environment, but it's not interesting enough, children will not do it. Children will not pay attention to it. They will not learn it. Uh, secondly, if repeatedly attention is drawn to that behavior, for example, you want to teach the child to greet, you repeatedly do that activity so that the child attends it and retains it 
if it is done multiple times lastly uh, thirdly uh, the child should have an opportunity to repeat it and should have the physical capability to repeat that behavior uh, and lastly motivation the if the child sees that there is a benefit of doing this behavior the child is more likely to repeat that behavior this is very important because uh, we might be teaching very good things to the child but it is very important to see what are the other things in the child's environment which the child is learning from outside now coming to handling misbehavior we have talked a lot about how to teach good behaviors to the child but let's try to understand why do children behave badly in the first place we are not teaching children to behave badly at least that's what we think so um, there are generally four goals of misbehavior this is given by drucker's where the child if the child is misbehaving they are doing in order to get your attention please understand in a child's world negative attention is better than no attention if nobody is giving attention to the child they will start behaving badly just in order to get your attention second uh, gain power and control some so if you understand uh, bullying why do some children bully at school is because they feel inside they are feeling very powerless in the class they are feeling very powerless and in order in order to feel powerful in order to have some control they start bullying children who they think are weaker than them Uh, number 3 is to gain revenge when they clearly think that somebody has done something bad to me and i need to take revenge they will misbehave lastly they have some feelings of inadequacy for example they feel they are not good at something so they don't even want to try they don't even want to try getting good at it and they try to do other behaviors in order to uh, compensate for it so whenever you see a child having problematic behaviors you need to understand which one of these is the child fitting in so what can you do once you have figured out which uh, which of these are the reasons why the child is misbehaving first of all if it is to gain attention if these are small harmful behaviors you can ignore the behavior because if you will give more attention to that behavior the child will do it more the second technique is that you can distract the child so for example temper tantrums if it is a small tantrum you can ignore the tantrum and continue doing your work if making sure that the child is safe secondly um, you can reinforce the good behaviors that the child is doing most rest of the time uh, uh, lastly you can distract the child by offering an alternative activity for example if the child is jumping on the table in order to get your attention instead of telling the child to get off the table or stop doing that you can ask the child please come here and uh, get me something from the kitchen so the child will stop doing that behavior they will go and get you something from the kitchen whatever small thing you had wanted and then you have to appreciate the child for that behavior for helping so you did not pay attention to the bad behavior instead you encouraged a positive behavior uh, when it is to gain power and control do not engage in the power battle with the child for example if the child is misbehaving because they just want to feel more powerful uh, don't engage in that power struggle don't let them feel that they have more power than you on the other hand uh, focus on other ways of how you can make the child feel powerful and feel that they have certain control this is a very um, a nuanced way of uh, discussion then this is generally when we talk about how do you handle bullying behavior from children when one child is bullying another child that is when we have these discussions and it is a little detailed discussion we can have it later uh, let's talk about gaining revenge again so children who are asking for uh, seeking revenge they are actually seeking revenge because they are hurt they are angry about something and angry anger is basically misplaced misplaced sadness so they are not feeling a sense of belonging and hence they want to take it so somebody has told them that you so it is important to understand child's emotions when they are behaving badly and rectify them address them at the root cause lastly if they are uh, showing uh, feelings of inadequacy you have to understand why they are feeling so may break the task into smaller tasks which they can do and they can gradually gain mastery on and then they can 
build their confidence again. Right. So that was a lot of uh, psychology techniques. And I tried to give you some of the examples of how these techniques can be used. Let's understand what are some of the important parenting tips that you should keep in mind when you are going through the journey of parenting. Well, first and most importantly, successful parents have healthy home atmospheres. Stable married couples are a good example for children. Th that does not mean that the single parent homes uh, are not capable of providing a loving and stable atmosphere for a child. Although they have more challenges than families who have co-parents, uh, overall, if a child's need for security, stability, and affection are met, the child will thrive. Setting limits and being consistent with your discipline is very important. Discipline is necessary in every household. This is how you teach, that, teach children that there are certain acceptable behaviors and they have to learn self-control. Uh, some You can have rules in your home like no TV until homework is done and you can't hit other people. When you're making that rule of no hitting other people, you also cannot hit your child. You have to remember that. No name calling, no hurtful teasing. Have a system in place. For example, if a child, uh, you have to have a system in place that, okay, one warning will be given. After that, you will have to face the consequences of your action. So uh, whatever time out or loss of privilege or whatever punishment you have set in place. Uh, so having a system in place is good. So rules are there in the house. Then lastly, be consistent and always follow through with the consequences. This is the most important thing because say, for example, one time when the child did the same behavior, you punished the child or you, the child had to face a consequence. Next time when the child did the same thing, you did not follow it through. You were like, okay, forget it. We'll see it next time. So for example, one time when the child did a temper tantrum, you were very strict with the child and you ignored the child and you did everything that was needed. Next time when the child was having a temper tantrum, you were feeling a little lazy and you gave whatever the child wanted. This will teach the child that these people are not consistent. If I increase my efforts, I might get what I want. So uh, if there is lack of consistency in your techniques, the child's problematic behavior will actually get aggravated. And this is the most important thing. So please be consistent with whatever reward or whatever consequence you are using. Again, the same thing, uh, use natural consequences. They are better than making up some artificial consequences. Consequences work better if they are direct and they are logically related to the situation. If your child is testing you and having a temper tantrum or speaking disrespectfully to you, it is best if you leave the room or tell the child calmly that you will be in the next room if they want to try again when they are calm. So when they are having an emotional breakdown, when they are angry at that time, it is best to first give them some time to cool off and then again have a discussion with them or again uh, hand, uh, tell them to come and talk to you but in a polite manner. Disciplining should never be this is very important for parents because a lot of times their disciplining is motivated by anger. You are angry and you are frustrated. You have come after a whole day of get, being tired and you might do things or say things that you really didn't mean. So uh, you have to be a little mindful of this, that your disciplining should never be motivated by anger, pride. This is very common that, you know, the child says something very inappropriate in a public setting and you are so uh, you you feel so ashamed because your child has done something in a public place which they were not supposed to do and you feel it reflects badly on you and your disciplining is coming from there you get so it so try to not do that try to not get into that loop that because my child has behaved badly i should be humiliated in front of people it's a child you can handle this behavior in a much more calm manner so please be sure, make sure that your disciplining is not motivated by anger, pride, anxiety, or other selfish reasons, as they will cause more harm than good. Instead, it should be motivated by your love and desire for the kids to become a better version of themselves. Lastly, um, uh, you have to boost your child's self-esteem. You may find yourself criticizing your kids far more than complimenting. 
how would you feel that your boss if your boss had treated you the same way so no matter what you did all your mistakes were pointed out but whatever good you did was never appreciated how would that make you feel uh, similarly no matter how constructive it was uh, lastly children develop their self esteem through their parents eyes your choice of words tone of voice body language and expressions everything is being observed and absorbed by the kids when your kids make mistakes criticize the wrong behavior not the child so don't label the child that you are a bad boy or you are a bad girl say what you did was not good make it a point to find something to praise your child every day and keep the praise genuine and catch your kids doing something right so whenever they are behaving well always appreciate it be generous with your rewards and child psychology says that social rewards work much better than punishment uh, uh, so if you reward the good behaviors you will see over time that the good behaviors will automatically start increasing and it will also work very well for the child's self esteem uh, be a good role model for your child so for example uh, your young kids are learning by how you act so before you lash out in front of your child think about it is this how you want your child to behave when they are angry child psychology studies have shown that children who hit or bully are usually are usually having a role model for aggression at home um, so whatever more traits you want to uh, your child to develop for example respect friendliness honesty kindness tolerance model those in front of your child let your child observe you doing these behaviors above all treat your kids the way you expect other people to treat you uh, make communication a priority uh, you can't expect kids to do everything simply because you are a parent and you say so and this is exactly uh, this becomes even more important once your chi child starts reading adolescence so uh, just because you are saying something children are not going to listen in that case it is always good to make your expectations clear and explain why you expect that if there is a problem if they disagree with you uh, describe it express your feelings express why you want them to do something and then ask your child for solutions what do they think they can do you don't have to accept their solutions immediately the moment they give them you can again debate them but then be sure to include consequences for example when they are giving you solutions and you think that and you think they have not thought of all the consequences that might be there you have to tell them that these are also consequences of what you are saying now what do you have to say so make suggestions and offer choices be open to your child's suggestion as well and negotiate uh, kids who participate in decisions are more motivated to carry them out uh, be flexible and willing to adjust your parenting style if you are often feel let down by your child's behavior maybe you have unrealistic expectations you might find it helpful to read up on the matter or to talk to other parents or a child behavior therapist as your child grows you will gradually have to change your parenting style what works for a 10 year old will not work for a 15 year old teenagers they look at their peer group for role models they they continue so in that case you have to allow them to have a peer group a healthy peer group and uh, but at the same time you have to provide guidance encouragement and appropriate discipline when you are giving them more independence so teenagers they are smart they are quite smart when it comes to their intelligence and cognitive development but in terms of social development and understanding of uh, uh, how the things work outside they are not that experienced and that developed you might be coming from a place of experience but you also have to understand that during the teenage years the child's brain is actually telling them to go out and take risk take take risks which basically means that children have higher risk taking adolescents not children adolescents have higher risk taking behaviors than adults think of yourself at 15 and think of yourself at 25 you will look back and see that you did a lot of stupid things when you were 15 and today as at at 25 or 35 you will be like why did i do that that was so stupid please understand that risk taking 
is much higher in adolescents they are more they, so that is the main reason why they are more likely to experiment with drugs more likely to do risky behaviors more likely to uh, get into problem you know run out of home or whatever which you may think at 25 makes absolutely no sense also understand your child's temperament so for example you have a very introverted child to be a stage uh, don't expect that if the child is very introverted don't put them in that place where they need to become a stage performer similarly if the child is very extroverted and is slightly hyperactive don't push them to sit in one place quietly for long hours don't expect them to wait for very long understand what is their limit and accordingly modify your environment modify the environment for them know your own needs and limitations as a parent face it first of all face it that you are an imperfect parent you don't know everything parenting is a skill we all can improve our parenting most important is your intent and goal what is your intent and what are you trying to achieve getting parenting guidance when things get tough is another useful strategy admit it when you're burnt out take time out to do things that will make you happy as a person or as a couple focus on your needs uh, that do not because that doesn't make you selfish in fact it teaches your children that your own well being is important and you don't have to be uh, self sacrificing all the time it is also a very important value for children to learn ask for professional help so a lot of times if you're still finding parenting difficult it is always a good idea to get your child evaluated by a child and adolescent psychiatrist So for example if there are conditions like autism adhd idd intellectual disability oppositional defiant disorder or a learning disability in the child which has not been figured out yet uh, similarly there can be some unaddressed issues like marital issues burnout anxiety disorders depression or personality issues in the parents or there can be just a mismatch of techniques mismatch of techniques between the parent and the child Uh, the child's temperament and the parent's techniques so it is always a good idea to get these things things assessed and then formally uh, get it looked into lastly getting professional help in parenting guidance in such circumstances might be very helpful so what are the take home points from today's uh, seminar well first of all understand your child's temperament understand their stage of development and then use communication environmental and reinforcement strategies accordingly disciplining and structure is essential but you have to be consistent and you have to use differential reinforcement techniques children are like sponges they are observing and internalizing behaviors around them so please be mindful of what they are observing lastly there is no thing is a perfect parent and there is no right and wrong way of parenting and we all are uh, lying in that normal range and we can all improve uh lastly few things are there which are definitely not to be done uh, which most parents i don't see doing these days is like humiliating the child or uh, using physical punishment on the child uh, lastly keep checking your parenting behaviors to make sure that they are not driven by your self esteem needs or anxieties the goal of successful parenting is to raise responsible independent and emotionally stable adults that is a good goal to have <laughs> uh if you want to uh, get into more positive parenting tips so i have tried to cover and i have not been very age specific if you want more tips on this you can go to this link on the cdc website where it has positive parenting tips as per different age groups so how do you what tips should you use as an infant as a toddler as a preschooler go through these and this will also help you this is a very good resource so lastly parenting is a transformative journey and as the child achieves milestones so does the parent